Do you see opportunities coming out of this? You know, if you could speak from a high level of like, you know, where you think the opportunities are. I almost, I'm old enough that I, I remember uh, during my first days as an analyst, uh, you know, I was just getting exposed to Microsoft Excel. Welcome to the Financial Innovations Podcast, where we're helping CFOs save money and time by investing in cutting edge technology. Really excited today to uh, introduce uh, Kostab Kandalwal. Uh, Kostab, very nice to have you on the show. Thanks, Danielle. Excited to be here. Awesome. So we have a, a bunch of uh, you know great topics to uh, to talk through today. Um, you know, how to save, uh, literally save money by investing in, in technology, uh, which is always, always great uh, for organizations to learn about um, processes around, you know, reviewing licenses to, you know, to see where, you know, cost cuts can happen. Um, you know, we may talk a little bit about, you know, AI and, you know, role in, in finance. Um, so, you know, definitely excited to get going. Um, do you want to just take a minute to, uh, to introduce yourself to our audience? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I have been in corporate finance. My name is Kostub Kandelwal, by the way, and uh, I've been in corporate finance for the last uh, 20 years in uh, lots of different industries, including consumer packaged goods, educational products like a B2B educational products, consumer banking with Capital One, enterprise software with VMware, and then went to physical retail with Lolly and Pops, and then... Um, a small online retailer called Amazon, uh, and lately, um, fashion marketplace at Poshmark. No, that that's great. And um, you know, before we get started, just to tell a little uh, how I learned about Poshmark. Uh, you know, my uh, my oldest daughter is two and a half years old, and she's uh, obsessed with dinosaurs. So she had these pair of dinosaur pajamas she has to wear every single night before she goes to bed got holes in them from washing them over and over again. And uh, I said, all right, I got to find a new pair of these. And uh, they were no longer at the store that, you know, we bought them from. So uh, I pulled up my Google Lens app and took a picture and it directed me to Poshmark uh, on where I could buy another uh, another copy uh, or a pair of them. And uh, that, you know, saved uh, saved my daughter sleeping at night. So I'm forever grateful to, uh, to Poshmark for connecting me with, uh, with the seller that, uh, that provided those uh, extra pair of pajamas there. Yeah, I mean, the, that just, uh, that summarizes how technology has been wonderful in connecting a search that you made and matching that to the product that we carried. And uh, I mean, think about this, like, you know, 10 years ago when you would have to find the, it's called the SKU number, stock keeping unit number, and then find out which retailer carried it. And it's such an arduous process. But now with image recognition, with Google Lens and, and uh, Posh Lens, which is our own um, image search capability, where you could actually just do it on the app um, and take that picture, uh, you'd be able to find that product um, natively um, into, into Poshmark's marketplace. That's going to be my go-to from now on because uh, you know uh, she literally would not refuse to wear any other any other replacement type of uh, pajamas that we offered. So uh, definitely going to be doing that. But you know, I remember the days where you know we used to have to drive to ten different stores to go and try and find you know a physical item that was the same, and you know how much of a, a hassle it was. And now you know it's just uh, all the technologies at you know at our fingertips, which. Uh, you know, it was a great segue into, uh, you know, uh, some of our content here today. So, um, you know, I, I know that a lot of executives are hesitant sometimes to invest in technology because they look at ROI of, you know, I want a new BI dashboarding system and I'm going to spend millions of dollars to, you know, to go in and, uh, uh, and implement this. And, you know, it's not really going to save me money per se. Uh, you know, sure, it might automate certain processes, but, you know, it's a significant expense for, you know, essentially a, a small cost savings or just, um, you know, a set of features. But I know that you've been, you know, investing in technology that, you know, is is better than just cost neutral, uh, you know, actually, you know, provides a significant cost savings. Um, so, you know, maybe if you want to talk a little bit about, you know, what kind of initiatives that you've been doing, how you've been able to, you know, not just achieve cost neutrality, um, you know, in, in, in it, but, you know, to do even better and to, to, to save money. 
Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And uh, usually being in finance, uh, we're always seen as the sort of cost police in some ways. Uh, but I would say that, um, you know, I've been in a lot of different roles over the last 20 years. Um, top line growth and cost savings are the two sort of biggest themes that finance teams get involved in. Um, at the same time, when I think about my career, I feel um, the best job that um, a company did in sort of unlocking the cost savings uh, sort of mindset was Amazon. Because what Amazon did was um, they had, they they basically termed this thing called uh, a free cash flow initiative, which is a great way to think about, you know, there's sources of cash, you know, where cash comes into the business and uses of cash where we spend out cash. And um, a lot of businesses just think about maybe smaller buckets on the P&L on where they need to uh, save money. But when you start looking at it on a cash basis, you actually expose a lot deeper insights into where the uh, business is spending money. And so, first of all, that was a great sort of aha moment. I'd, I've been involved in a lot of cost savings projects before that, but because Amazon... Um, created a lot more branding around it. It was actually um, a lot cooler uh, uh, projects to be involved in. And so when I got to um, Poshmark, for example, I, you know, I'm in a senior role here, a lot closer to the action, and I can, I feel that, um, you know, I, I'm finding strengths that I didn't even know I had uh, uh, by, by launching these sort of free cash flow initiatives, just bringing that playbook from Amazon into Poshmark. And all we're trying to do is go down the PL, understand where the costs are, what are the drivers of the costs, and um, and sort of uh, unpacking uh, what is actually working for the business and what's not. And whatever is not working for the business can go up for debate on whether we need to spend that money or not. Yeah, it's very interesting that um, that you said that about the the free cash flow because you know more often than not, you know uh, when I help organizations and, you know, look at the finance function in there. It's more along the lines of, you know, hey, here's what was spent. Here, what's our budget for next year? Like there aren't many um, initiatives that are being driven from finance to say, do we really need, you know, these types of, you know, software licenses? Are there cost saving initiatives that we can do? It's more along the lines of, OK, here's the report that says what was spent now, you know, operations team go off and, you know, and, and, and do with that what, what you will. Yeah, that's very, very true. And, and part of it, actually, I feel like I was uh, explaining in my background, I feel fortunate that I've worked for an enterprise software company. So I understand licenses, the different types of licenses. And, and, uh, and so uh, it actually helps me ask some deeper questions around, hey, uh, do they need to be individual locked licenses? Can they be shared licenses? Do we actually need 100 licenses or we only can we only do, do with 10 uh, for the people that are going to use it? And so that's that's been uh, very critical in sort of understanding where the costs are. Because ultimately, I think of like, you know, the finance people need to think of the business as their own shop. How would you spend money if you were running the shop, right? That's That's very critical. Yeah. And, and more often than not, you know, companies get lost in the per user license of, oh, it's only $200, you know, per user for this, uh, for the year. Like it's not a significant expense. Uh, and then you start adding up the $200 a user for this license and the $500 a user for that license. And before you know it, you're, you know, you're spending a hundred thousand dollars a month, uh, you know, on, on 10 different products and you don't even know if it's being used or, you know, or not. So, you know, it's, uh, definitely something that, um, you know, is is a recommendation for any company out there of, you know, it's easy to get lost in those SaaS licenses and how much you're paying per user. And, you know, it's it's great to periodically review. Do you need, you know, do you need this? And, you know, it's great in your situation because you have a lot of expertise around license types. And can we shift, you know, can we get the same number of users in there and just kind of shift the the license type to save some money? Um, and, you know, have some creative ways in order to be able to, you know, get the utilization of the software you need while saving, you know, uh, the, the firm as much money as you can. Yeah, you hit it on the head with the $200 licenses per person. That's exactly what happens. The other thing that happens is 
a lot of these contracts auto renew. So, uh, you know, not only like if you miss the window, you're, you're in a contract and it's very hard to sort of cancel that contract. Uh, so you almost have to set up a clock 90 days before the contract is up for renewal that you actually do a deeper review and then decide uh, what what we need to do with the contract. Could we carry, carry the same contract, reduce the number of licenses or completely next the next SaaS vendor because we're not really using it. Yeah, no, that that's great, you know, because that's the other downfall to all these different cloud platforms. They all renew at different dates and times. And, you know, it's easy to just say, oh, you know, let this, you know, let this continue um, and let's just renew it. We know we used it versus do you know you used it, but do you know how much you used it and whether you need to use it at the same level there before, you know, before moving, uh, you know, whether reducing license count, shifting license type and, you know, and, and so forth over there. So you know, very, um, very wise to to go through and, and do that. And, you know, also to, you know, I think a good opportunity that a lot of companies have with licenses uh, is understanding, uh, you know, do we have multiple licenses for similar products across the board? Um, you know, I talked about this with a prior guest, but, you know, more often than not, you go into these big companies and you see that um, they have an enterprise license of Tableau and also an enterprise license of Power BI and also an enterprise license of ClickView. And, and, you know, and you say, wait a second, uh, you know, you have three different BI tools that are, are very similar in nature, enterprise licenses for each, you know, can we save money by, you know, having a company standard uh, and moving to that type of technology versus, um, you know, does everybody have to have a, a different, you know, flavor of the same, the same type of product? Yeah. Absolutely. Spot on. Yeah. And, you know, I, I know uh, some of, you know, some of the other things that, um, you know, uh, were interesting. And, and I know that uh, our guests will have, uh, um, you know, a, a lot of thoughts around is, you know, just around what you guys have done in terms of implementing technology, you know, specifically with, with the rebates in order to, um, you know, not only be a, you know, cost, uh, you know, neutral type of project, but, you know, in order to actually save the company and make the company more, uh, more money, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll tell you uh, the one big area that we made some tech investment, and it's actually not a dollar investment, it was largely time investment because the dollar investment was almost free, was around expense management. And so there we actually got uh, a provider that was able to give us the expense management for free and uh, for, for the first two years. And then we also um, got a, a corporate credit card for each of our sort of credit card uh, holders uh, that gives us almost a, a one and a half to two percent rebate on all of the spent, which we were not getting earlier. So there are two things that happened. Before this, um, people were spending money on uh, a, either a Comerica, like a small business credit card or their personal card, and then filling their expense information uh, or copying their receipt on a Google sheet, attaching the receipts and, uh, and filling out the memo. And because that's a lot of human sort of intervention, it's really hard because, uh, you know, not everyone fills it out. People fill it out late their on their expense reimbursements it's a poor customer experience and then accounting is uh, is struggling because they're now chasing down people to say hey you did not give me a memo on what this spend was on how many people attended that lunch what was it about is it a business lunch team lunch uh, so uh, so the categorization of expenses and the uh, the actual timeliness of expense management was really uh, really a challenge for us so after this uh, implementation, there are two things that happen. So uh, let's say, for example, I got a card. I go to a restaurant and let's say I'm taking out a colleague for lunch. I pay the bill. I get a text saying, hey, it looks like you went to this restaurant. Uh, can you write a memo? So you text the memo. The memo gets uploaded. Accounting already receives the data through, uh, through the sort of APIs, goes into NetSuite, the categorization is done because, you know, my card is attached to the finance team and it's seamless. So it reduced the amount of work the accounting was doing. I also got the business got like a, you know, a nice rebate out of that spend. And, 
and it simplified the process. It was a complete win, win, win. And um, over time, the key business metric we're trying to do uh, uh, manage on this card is what percentage of our spend. So even the vendor spend, like if you're spending money on certain vendors, can go on this card. So what percentage of our spend can go on this card so that we can earn rebates off of it? So that's a very clear free cash flow win because that, you know, let's say you get a one and a half percent rebate that, that you were not getting earlier and it's a hundred million dollar spend. That's a million five that you get at income that you weren't getting earlier. And so that's a, uh, those are like pretty massive wins uh, once you, once you get the ball rolling. Right. And, and, and on top of that, it's not even just, uh, it, um, like a savings to the company. It's also a better experience for the people, you know, that, that are doing, I mean, you know, back, uh, when, before COVID, when, uh, when consultants traveled a lot, you know, I, for, for six years, I was, you know, on a plane every, every Monday and Thursday, uh, flying somewhere and, you know, my, I had to do all sorts of expense, uh, things and fill out this, you know, type into this system, what you spent here and why and all that. And it was such a cumbersome experience. Of course, I never did it right away. And so, uh, you know, I would have to, at the end of the month, uh, you know, go and, uh, and fill out 4,000 line items of, uh, of expenses and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, to be able to just, right then and there, text the memo. And, you know, you don't have to type in the number that you spent at that restaurant because it was already fed to a system. So it already knows that it was a restaurant and can classify it as a restaurant. It knows how much you spent. All you have to do is say whether you ate alone or with other people and what the purpose of the the meal was and, you know, and you're done. I mean, it's, uh, you know, definitely something where, you know, people's time can be better spent doing other things rather than, you know, uh, entering information that can easily be fed to, uh, to, to other systems. Yep, exactly. So, you know, and, and at the same time, you're, you know, you're saving, uh, saving the company money by getting access to rebates that, that you didn't have before. You know, I, I think this is something that, you know, highly recommend, uh, companies to look at, you know, the whole free cash flow analysis over there because, you know, like we talked about before, a lot, you know, finance function is very much, you know, you want your report, here's your report. You want to know how much you spent, here's how much you spent, here's your budget. You know, I'm going to take last year's budget, increment it by 3%, and that's this year's budget, right? And, you know, versus yeah. to be able to say, do we have to spend 3% more this year than, than last year? Are there opportunities and initiatives inside that, you know, may be a, you know, a financial expense to do, or it might just be a, a process type of uh, uh, change that we need to do where, you know, just shift the way we're doing things a little bit. We don't have to go and spend money to implement a system to, to go and do it. But by optimizing the process, we now have, you know, an extra million five that we didn't have last year. Uh, and now we don't have to just go take that budget from last year, up it by two, three percent and say, here's our budget for this year. We can you know, be more intelligent about how we're investing the company money and, you know, how, how the company can grow based on that. Absolutely. I, I think, I think this process does two things uh, or three things. One is the rebate you talked about. The other is process simplification uh, for accounting as well as the people who are using it. The third is like greater transparency because now you're able to see very quickly where the spend is, how much it is and, and in the right categories so planning becomes better and uh, and it's actually healthier for the company to understand where we're spending money because that way you can have, uh, you know, if you want to have a difficult conversation, you can have those. Right. And at the end of the day, that's what it's about is about being able to have that conversation and really understand, you know, not just, you know, these are numbers on a report saying that we spent this amount of money, but knowing that you know, we can improve our, our business, you know, we could either find a way to make the business more money, which, you know, it's great, you, you know, you have those types of initiatives um, that you're able to do, you know, we can, we can reduce some expenses. And, you know, a lot of people cringe when they hear reduce expenses, because the first connotation is uh, how many people are we firing, right? But, you know, being able to save uh, that magnitude of, of, you know, money without having to, you know, let go employees to, to be able to do it. You know, those are, you know, those are many of the initiatives that I think get underreported that, you know, where people are cringing because they hear cost cutting, 
And it's an issue, you know, it's okay. What, how much are we reducing headcount versus cost cutting of how do we find smarter and better ways to, you know, to use the resources that we have, um, you know, for, for better gains. Yeah. And, uh, to be honest, like, you know, cost cutting with headcount is actually not fun. That's not where, uh, you know, finance enjoys like you typically, that's not an area that, uh, you know, is, is, uh, is really great. It's actually, this is in some ways, first line of defense. If we can make our overall spend more efficient, then it, relieves the burden of profitability from the business a little bit, and then we can focus more on growth. That's the idea. And most of these software solutions should unlock capacity for us. If they're simplifying this, this, um, you know, this portion, then hopefully we don't have to, the, the, the resource capacity that was going towards chasing down people can now be allocated for something else. And so that incremental investment that we needed may not be needed. So the business is still growing, but we just don't need additional resources because we've invested in simplification and more automation of the business. And that's the, that's the, that's definitely the part that's more exciting. Yeah, definitely. And I want to talk a little bit about process in a second over here, um, you know, and, and optimizing processes. But I, I think that, you know, a hidden, um, you know, anytime you talk to a software vendor and they start, you know, saying, here's the ROI of this or that you know, there's a, like an underlying assumption that, you know, by implementing this technology, you know, now you don't have, you know, you, you don't need a hundred people in your organization to go and do it. And it's, well, wait a second, we're not going to just go and fire a hundred people tomorrow. And, you know, and then the analysis and the ROI is all based on that assumption. So when you look at what you end up getting in the end, um, and the fact that you didn't let go of anybody, you know, it, it's a, it's a negative ROI on a lot of initiatives that, are painted positive versus just by optimizing processes, you know, you're not going to just go and, you know, fire a hundred people because you implemented a piece of technology, you found a cost savings to the organization. And that's a real ROI because, you know, like you actually got the entire value of what, you know, what you were looking for. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And, and the way, uh, I mean, those, those situations are tricky and the way typically finance tries to measure, um, is productivity improvement in the department. So if the business is getting more complex, if it's growing and yet your headcount costs aren't growing because you implemented in the, the, that system, that's also a good way to see that there's leverage being created in that department over time. So, or if your revenues are rising, but your costs are staying flat, you, your, uh, your at least cost as a percentage of that revenue is either flatlining or coming down, which is great. That's that's where you see that your the department is becoming more and more efficient, and that's actually one of the things that you know we as finance uh, like to do is when a department requests, let's say, a financial system, if if the ROI is coming from the sales team uh, from the from the financial system, to your point, it'll it'll be more on the headcount driven. What we say is, what is what is it going to look like two years, three years from now? And uh, how much more can you process without adding, you know, too much headcount? Like, what's the leverage, overall cost leverage that we can get from that department? Headcount expense plus non-headcount expense, which is all of the system expense. If that total cost per uh, per revenue dollar is coming down, that's that's great. That that then uh, feels like a win. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And how do you go about identifying like where the opportunities are for certain like process? Uh, you know, are there certain like metrics you're looking at to see, hey, this is something we should look at in more detail in terms of, um, you know, whether or not there are opportunities to streamline the process or, you know, reduce cost in, you know, a, a certain way? Yeah, I think um, the one thing I learned about, you um, opportunities at Amazon is like you almost have to set a target and then what happens is when you set that target people invent and simplify around that target so I would say there's opportunities pretty much everywhere now the size of opportunity would be would be different and the 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 fun part is the teams are big enough that they should be focused on the opportunities in their space because they would know best on what the opportunity is. and so what we try to do is partner a finance team member with that business team or the functional team 
to work on the opportunities and go really deep into understanding like you know if i was the finance guy working with somebody in operations i would be sitting with them in their shoes trying to understand what the process is and inevitably what happens is just like you've been in consulting when you get a fresh pair of eyes looking at some processes some things jump out and say why are we doing this way and uh, and then coming out of that conversation there's we've had pretty high success rate on opportunities uh, that come in yeah no that's that's great and you know just um you know it's it's important to have that partnership you know with the functional area because obviously there's the domain expertise and the you know we know how we do things and and all that where you guys can look at the numbers and say hey i see you're spending a million dollars uh you know uh, on on this particular area do you really need to spend it in some areas there may be nothing you can do and and that's the the rock bottom over there in other areas it might be well if we implemented this or you know just changed a process optimized a process to be able to do this then you know we could you know cut that in half and you know and that opens the door to a lot of opportunity that you know you guys just looking at the numbers may not know and you know those guys just handling the operations they may not know how much it actually costs to you know to do things the way they're doing it and a lot of people get trapped in the this is how we've always done it so here's how we're going to do it going forward versus you know hey you're right this is costing too much money to uh, to continue to to do it like this let's you know come up with a creative and you know innovative way to 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 go and and uh, you know minimize the cost yeah are there like particular thresholds that you look at for like you know i mean if if something's like a thousand dollar expense over a year you know obviously you know i mean there might be an opportunity to optimize it but you know if from the, is it worth the the time you know kind of uh you know aspect of it are there certain thresholds that you look at of uh you know is worth it or or looking into or not it's a great question uh so the way i do it uh daniel is um and this is just based on the company like poshmark uh today publicity scales at amazon scale it was very different and at poshmark scale uh, we're, we're a smaller company but what i've done is anything that is like $150,000 or above i take a look at like you know if it's a vendor renewal coming up or new vendor coming up and anything below that i'm actually also uh, you know uh, working with my team so that they also develop this muscle so anything below that they actually get involved with the business team in in the negotiations process and i can come in uh, and and like you know coach every once in a while uh, but they're also learning and sometimes they do a better job than I, i can so uh, i think it's great to uh, the, the the framework and the structure is the one that actually is a bigger value to the company like once you put that framework in it it feels like it's so obvious once you do it but uh, but until you have uh, until that structure people are usually more stuck into the reporting cycle here's what happened to your to your point and here's uh, here's you know here's where we're going and it's just extension of trends but once you put the structure in it actually you understand that you have a seat at the table in this decision on whether you're going to renew with this uh, this vendor or not and it just opens up the eyes of the team that hey you know what i had an impact here i can point to this renewal and i actually helped the company save 20% by, by the negotiation which is which is fantastic that's 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 where i think you get people hooked and and uh, they really love their job so that that's what's exciting yeah no i completely agree with that and you know part of the reason i started this show was you know companies you know not necessarily of the massive scale you know i've i've worked with plenty of those but you know the smaller type of companies i feel like a lot of them hide behind the hey we're a small company with a small budget so you know uh if if we had unlimited budget like you know insert fortune 500 company name over here we'd be able to do things better you know and then you go and you find at at those you know bigger companies yeah there might be allowed to have more waste in their uh in their spend and you know the margins uh of error and you know and and what needs to be optimized might you know be be at a different level but you know there is power in every organization big mid-sized small to say hey look if if we can optimize you know uh and streamline our processes 
it's not a matter of we don't have the money to do this. Let's go in and look within to see, can we find savings in certain areas to go and apply to other areas where we want to invest in and in, in grow the business? Yeah, uh, absolutely spot on. Yeah, I think I think the, the other thing that happens is sometimes companies get pressured into making quick decisions on profitability. And if this muscle hasn't been developed over time, then they end up making, you know, wrong decisions, uh, short term and long term, because then then you're using a blunt instrument to cut the cost out. And that's a very dangerous, uh, dangerous thing for uh, stability of the business and, and overall long term health and also the morale of the people. So it's almost like this is something that if finance does it on a regular basis, it just it's good for business hygiene, health and uh, just, you know, uh, keeping the, uh, everyone understands it. Like, you know, once, once you have the conversation, once you actually, if we're working with a department and they were involved with that negotiation and we saved the money, you have to recognize the business leaders too, that, Hey, it wasn't the finance department that did this. You did it. And so it's a co-ownership, co-celebration of that, that saving. And that, that creates a very different mindset that, Hey, it's not finance police. It's, I have a partner who's going to go with me and uh, we'll stand toe to toe with the vendor to really understand what the cost structure should be. And that's very important. Right. And, and, you know, it takes finance out of that. You know, we're just the guy sitting in cubicles in the corner of the room over here, analyzing numbers. And, you know, you're actually involved in day to day operations of the business. You know, you may not be, you know, specifically doing certain things, but, you know, you're partnering with with people and together, you know, you're coming, you know, to a common goal, you know, to your point on employee morale, you know, feeling like, hey, I was part of something because I saved 20 percent, um, you know, by streamlining this area. Sure, you didn't do it alone, but, you know, like you got to work closely with someone that day to day you may not have, you know, ever you know, called that person or talked to that person or whatever. And now you get to work together, you know, for a, for a common uh, business goal. Yeah, that's right. You know, I think that's really powerful and, you know, it just, um, you know, expands the opportunities beyond to just, you know, Hey, we run the reports and, you know, and, and provide them to, to whoever's needed. Yep, exactly. Oh, that's great. Um, so, you know, lastly, um, you know, just wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, um, I know that, you know, we, we see things coming out in the news, uh, pretty much every day here about AI and, you know, how, uh, you know, robots are taking over the planet and, uh, you know, everybody's jobs are gone and, you know, and, and, and all that. And, you know, while some reports are bleak, others are, you know, hopeful that, you know, opportunities arise in there, you know, I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on, you know, AI and its role in, in finance, uh, specifically, you know, is this a job killer? Do you see opportunities coming out of this? Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, if you could speak from a high level of like, you know, where you think the opportunities are. Yeah, that's a great, uh, great question and great area uh, of interest for me. I almost, uh, you know, I'm old enough that I, I remember, uh, during my first, uh, days as an analyst, uh, you know, I was just getting exposed to Microsoft Excel uh, and uh, had to learn um, VLOOKUP, uh, pivot tables, and I had to, uh, you know, understand visual basic macros, uh, record a macro, so those kind of things. And I feel that uh, the folks that learned and were able to perform better uh, were able to accelerate their careers and and uh, and use this this functionality of excel as a tool to grow in life and the ones that didn't probably find other found other things uh, but the probability of success was lower and i think the same thing is going to be true for ai it's a tool it's going to get better but it's really a tool where uh, as a as a finance professional i'm very excited to go hands on and automate my way out of my job, even if I have to do it, just because it's such a cool thing to do that that skill set is going to get me another job and another one, right? It's That's the way I think about it, because if I don't think about it that way, I'm going to be always afraid of trying it out um, to its fullest extent. So I think it's actually, um, it's it's the 
people are afraid to to say that they're using <clears throat> some of this generative AI technology uh, professionally, but I think I think it's actually it should be celebrated. It should be shared because it's still in the formative stage, uh, and <clears throat> it makes mistakes. But it uh, uh, you know as you get better at prompting it, it as, and it gets better at responding. This is a fascinating uh, uh, change in technology happening in front of our eyes. And so uh, I see a lot of applications. I know Koshmark is thinking about a lot of them, which I can't really talk about. Uh, but uh, I'm sure a lot of companies are thinking about how to use generative AI uh, to improve their, uh, their sort of business model, uh, the way they interact, and, and just overall workflow management. And so I'm very excited about this technology and, and you know, em embracing it both in personal and professional life. Yeah, no, that that's great. Where, where do you think, um, you know, I guess investment in AI should be like to a, a finance, you know, leader, to a, to a CFO, to a VP finance, like where, where does AI fall in their, you know, priority list of things that they should be in, investing in? Yeah, I, I would say um, it is a uh, pretty high, uh, it's a competitive advantage. It's almost uh, uh, an imperative to think about uh, AI investment because if you're not thinking about it, your competitors are. And if they're going to bring products to market faster and better than you are because of that capability, then uh, you owe it to your business and the customers to be thinking about it. So. I, I would say it's it's uh, very important, uh, but at, at the same time, understanding the use cases and where it works, where it doesn't work, is also very important. Um, and <clears throat> I think the overall um, landscape is still sort of evolving on where you want to make the investment. Uh, the the tech uh, part of the company has a different use case with you know. Uh, things that work in tandem with the uh, sort of GitHub, uh, maybe GitHub Copilot, so that they talk to each other a lot better. Uh, at the same time, in, in finance, for example, the use cases we can look at is we're, we're kind of like the Amazon shop where we're writing memos. And so uh, converting a, a looker report and <clears throat> writing a memo to share about how the business did last week is a great use case. We can actually take Looker data uh, and give a report that we wrote manually and say, hey, update this report for the latest Looker report. And, uh, you know, your generative AI model can actually go fetch that data and replace. And eventually, uh, it might even be able to give you insights. We're not quite there yet, uh, but that's, that's where I think this is going. Yeah, no, I, I think those are all great points. You know, I've, I've used uh, AI extensively in, you know, in, in what, what I do. And, you know, it, it just, it also, you know, reduces the learning curve for somebody being able to, to get in where, you know, can I go and code? Yes, I can go and code. But if I can write three sentences and, and tell an AI model to write that code for me, then, you know, it, it saved me hours or, you know, days of, of work just uh, having that, you know, generated in seconds where I can go and take, uh, you know, certain utilities and, and go and deploy them and, you know, offer them, you know, up uh, open source them for other companies to, to learn from and use as well. And, uh, you know, it just in improves the overall quality of, you know, what what's happening and reduces the amount of time that it takes that I can go and focus on, you know, other things that are going to add value in, uh, in the organization. Yeah, absolutely. Especially those tasks that you're not doing every single day where, you know, back, uh, early on, you may have been writing, you know, macros every single day. Once you, your models get to a point where they're fairly stable. Now you're writing macros once a, once a month, once a quarter, you know, a year from now, you go back to to go and modify it, and you don't even remember how to write a macro anymore because you know you just haven't done it in in so long. So uh, you know, I've had a couple clients go and say, "Oh, can you write me a macro that does this?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I, I can. I got a you know." And and it used to be you go and you look online for sample code of somebody doing something similar, and now to be able to tell a model, 
I have my data here. I need to do a lookup over here. Can you write me a macro that goes and does it? It'll go and do that in seconds. And it's not, you know, similar code that you have to go and modify. It is the exact code that you need in your, you know, particular example. That's right. I think the same thing is going to happen with, I think, um, software engineers. My son is a, uh, the, a uh, student of computer science, and I think he's he's starting to use it um, quite well, quite extensively, and and uh, feels that it at least gives a thirty to forty percent productivity jump. It's needs to go in and and uh, you know modify the code every once in a while, but uh, it's it's incredibly fast in deploying products and changes, uh, and it's. Uh, that's it's a skill set similar to like you know pivot table and we look up uh, yeah no i 100 percent agree and i think one area that's often overlooked is you know i think like coding gets a lot of uh you know oh it wrote your code for you and that's great i think like areas that are often you know overlooked or underreported are you know its ability to go and take code that's written and tell you exactly what's happening you know in in you know in english of uh you know to someone that's not a coder Hey, here's what's happening. It could generate your comments on there. Um, you know, I wrote a bit of software, you know, probably 12 years ago that um, I just said, you know what? I just want to see how good this thing is. Let me just plug this this code into, you know, into chat GPT. And I put it in there. It told me exactly what it is that it was doing, even though I didn't tell it what it was doing. Uh, and then I said, oh, by the way, if you just change your code from this to this, it's going to run five times faster. And, uh, you know, it, it told me that uh, that I was a lou lousy programmer, but, uh, you know, it uh, helped uh, boost efficiency and, you know, be able to generate that documentation that, you know, I, I know a lot of companies struggle with this where, you know, you do and it could be anything from technology implementation to process improvement and the work gets done, you get the, you know, the the benefit at the end that you're looking for. And then, you know, nobody wants to go back and write up the documentation and, and all that, because that's, you know, always seen as the, you know, the there's better use of my time than, than writing up a document to do this, right? Versus, um, you know, being able to plug it into, you know, AI and have it go, all right, here's my code, here's what I came up with that solved the problem. Now, you go and summarize this for me and, and write it up, you know, you can get um, you know, the knowledge written down as, you know, as you would need it to be without, you know, having to invest that amount of time into, you know, a perceived, uh, you know, low value task. Yeah, that's uh, exactly right. So I know we're coming up uh, on uh, the end of the show over here. Uh, I think it was great. You know, you definitely provided a lot of insights, uh, you know, to the audience. We really, you know, appreciate it. Um, you know, and we, we definitely encourage our viewers to, you know, like the content, uh, subscribe to make sure that, you know, um, you get to see any, uh, additional guests we have on, we can bring other, you know, great guests like Kostov on the, on the show over here. Um, so, you know, kind of where, where I wanted to, to end was just in case, you know, if, if, uh, our viewers or anyone had questions, what's the best way for, uh, for them to, to be able to reach you and we'll, we'll put the information in the description so that, you know, they can just copy and paste, but, but where, uh, where would you like people to, to find you? I think the best, uh, mechanism is LinkedIn. Um, so feel free to reach out, uh, happy to help anyone who's thinking through how to implement free cash flow programs at their, at their company, uh, always up for coffee or beer. <laughs> Yes. And, uh, mostly the latter, right. But, uh, <laughs> it was great. Uh, you know, definitely great having you on the show. Really appreciate your time. Um, you know, you provided us with so much, you know, great information and highly encourage everybody to, you know, look into free cash flow initiatives, look for ways that, you know, um, you know, innovative and creative ways that you can go, uh, you know, help, uh, save, your organization, uh, certain expenses, and you know it, it, it doesn't involve firing people, uh, um, you know, in, in, in every case over there, and uh, you know it'll it'll just uh, you know help add a lot of long term value. Yes, thank you for having me, Daniel and Mark. It's been great. Yeah, definitely. We're, we're definitely going to have uh, reach out to you again to uh, to do a follow up uh, at some point to see uh, you know kind of other uh, other great ideas and initiatives that you have as well.